Welcome back to Confessions of a Cosmetic Chemist. I am your host, Manuela Mercajani. I'm a cosmetic chemist with over 35, sometimes it's 40 years experience in the industry. And uh, this podcast is about the beauty of business. Um, this industry is fascinating and there's so much to do as a cosmetic chemist. There's, there's a lot of insight and a lot of things that we've been exposed to, I've been exposed to, and I'm hoping to share those experiences and I hope you find them interesting. So today we're going to talk about clean beauty. This is part two of clean beauty. What are the benefits? What do you want to look at, you know, look for? What can we learn more about and share insight in? So I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I think the clean beauty, for me, I became much more aware of clean beauty about 10 years ago. I would say it's about, it had been about 10 years. And I think that this is how it happened. First, you have beauty that was, um, there was, there was skincare and it was celebrity based or it's pro it's popular skincare based on a celebrity or Hollywood. Then skincare became more doctor based or science based. There were chemists or companies that you never got to meet them. There were men in lab coats, white lab coats. Then skincare became more open because of digital marketing and media and TV shopping, and people became much more interactive with their skincare. And I think the consumer was demanding more. When I first came into the industry uh, 25, 27 years ago on TV shopping, and we started talking about ingredients in science as cosmetic chemists, we were very, very first at that. People were not cosmetic chemists or scientists. People were spokespeople or estheticians or beauty people. Even doctors didn't talk about it. This was not an area doctors came into. Celebrities were there. There were a lot of celebrities, you know, Phyllis Diller, Diller Connie Stevens. Um, there were Hollywood um, spokespeople. They all had this glamour about the industry. So as the industry became a little bit more mainstream and more open and more interactive, I believe, what happened was there needed to be a point of demarcation. So we started becoming evidence-based skincare. We were science-based, problem-solution-based. Then there was a growth in that problem-solution-based. Now the market changed to, yes, skincare is evidence-based. We're using science, but we're using clean science. They're using dirty science. And I think this is where clean beauty came out of. Clean beauty came out of they're trying to make a separation between science, good science and bad science. We like to say science fact and science fiction. And I think this is where, because people are afraid of science, people are afraid of chemicals, people are afraid of these big words, they must be bad, they must be poisonous, they must be toxic. Um, and it, people in the industry want to give you ingredients that are not good for you. There had to be like, I'm safe. I'm a brand that's safe. I'm a brand that's clean. So I, I think that this is where Clean Beauty came out of. It came out of trying to separate this, this science that's scary. Even today, you can have a conversation with people and they will say, I live a chemical-free life. I, there, I have absolutely no chemicals. I do everything natural. And you say to them, water is a chemical. They lose their minds. It blows their minds up. They don't even understand that chemicals can be good. Chemical is not a bad word. And that mindset propels the concept or the need for clean beauty. It's so misleading, right? Because it's just understanding their, their Toxicity is the problem and any ingredient can be clean and still toxic, you know, because dependent on its dosage and concentration, your exposure over a certain period of time can make something that is otherwise friendly, something very, very dangerous. So this is where the clean, I, I, it loses its, loses its validity, I believe. But I think that this is where it came from. I came from a need to help people feel better about ingredients and saying, well, these are ingredients that are safe and they're clean. Clean beauty benefits are the fact that it did open up a discussion. It has opened up a lot of awareness. It has made certain categories and certain ingredients much more mainstream much more open and much, and because it's opened up awareness and conversation, that's a benefit. Anytime you're being educated, anytime you're understanding more about what's going on, that could only be a benefit when you're understanding that. So the fact that 
ingredients can be broken down, certain ingredients can be identified. Maybe there are ways of pushing the industry in a way that to be a little bit more inventive or to move away from certain technologies. Those are all benefits. I also think it's been, so it's beneficial for the scientist uh, because it, it exposes us to more ingredients. It's beneficial for the industry because they create a lot more ingredients with bigger stories all around them. So they're always, you know, so this, this, this actually pushes innovation, good and bad. Some of it's just going to be a romantic story, but some of it is really good science that they come up with. But I think it also benefits the consumer because now the consumer has different levels or different points of reference. How do people choose the correct clean beauty product? I really think that when you're looking for your skincare, clean beauty, unless you absolutely for lifestyle reasons, unless you're absolutely, you know, vegan or vegetarian, or you have strong beliefs or allergies, right? Unless there's something that really compels you to be thinking in a certain mindset because you have to use a certain type of formulation because it subscribes to your thousand percent beliefs, right? For me, you just pick your skincare based on the ingredients that you need to deal with the issue at hand. They should all be clean. They should all be non-toxic, right? Um, and so I think that you don't have to really get caught up in the notion of clean. Clean is almost like, it doesn't really serve you the way you think it's serving you. Because at the end of the day, it's going to always be about the active ingredient in the delivery system working with your skin. And that's going to be the most efficient, cleanest for you. I think one of the main problems with clean beauty, what, what makes it difficult for me is the fact that there is no definition to clean beauty. Clean beauty in itself doesn't have one definition. Although many brands have tried to um, taper or streamline definitions uh, around certain main top topics, right? So you have the topic of natural, green, sustainable, biodynamic, organic, vegan, and non-toxic. So all of these are like big, huge blanket statements when you think about them, and they leave a lot of space. I mean, you can kind of find one of those little umbrellas and hide your brand underneath it by making a few little tweaks in your marketing and maybe a couple of things to do in, in your label claim. Like you can basically say that, you know, you are organic by using one or two ingredients that are organic because even organic itself has its own hierarchy of regulation. You don't have to be hundred percent organic. You can just put a couple of actives in a product and those products are organic. So then the whole formula could be called organic. So that's, that's another podcast. That's going to be another topic to talk about, but with the definition, because the definition changes, brands can then claim a definition. So you've got Sephora, for example, that will say clean as defined by Sephora. And I heard a cute one where they're now Sephora is clinically clean. So this means that they've got clean at Sephora, which is one standard. So that probably goes for like makeup and um, maybe body products or something. And then they have clinically clean, which is going to be their actives for anti-aging and maybe acne, right? And so they they tweak the definition. Then you're going to have another brand. Maybe you're going to go to a large department store and they're going to say that they're clean. Then you're going to go to a different brand, maybe like Rare Beauty, who will say that they're clean because of what they're using in their formulas. And they'll define what clean is. I know that I have worked with brands that want clean product, but they never even tell us. We actually just formulate, make their product. And then when you go and look at their marketing, they talk about how they're clean and they talk about how they fit into all these different categories because they've tweaked the words around. I've also been in places where you just declare you're clean and there's zero proof. There's no certification. There's no documentation. Nobody comes and runs analysis. Nobody verifies. Is it true? They just basically may, maybe somebody will casually look at the inky list at the back of a bottle and say, hmm, does it look like there's anything bad in here? But we don't know who these people are. We don't even know what their qualifications are to be able to do that. I have been at places where distribution networks, where they say we only accept clean beauty products. 
and I've looked at, and it's like the wild, wild west. There's everything there. And I'll say, but this isn't clean. It has this. And then, and you know what the buyers will say? Well, the vendor says they're clean. That's all I need to know. I just needed to ask them. This is just my management tells me it should be clean. And so they can put it on their shelf and they can allow it. And then people talk about it as a clean product. And, you know, inside I had the little brat in me like stomping my feet going, that is not true. This is not right. This is really not what clean should be, right? I think clean should be a lot more noble than just fitting into that. So if, so for people who are truly wanting to be like vegan or vegetarian or natural, even that, you have to really look at, you have to do your homework. You have to really understand who the company is and where they're coming from, what their philosophy is. But a lot of brands will use ingredients to fit certain claims that they can make. They just think, you know, when we go to these trade shows, they basically tell you what the trends are going to be, right? So they're going to tell you, no, it's all sustainable. So last year and the year before, every, everybody's sustainable. Everybody and their mother's sustainable, right? You know, the and all they've done is they've they've changed a couple of esters and a couple of silicones and a couple of ingredients, and all of a sudden they just make these claims, you know, and they say, well, we already we already knew this thing dissolves, but or, or this is not invi you know, it's not bad for the environment, but we've remarketed it, we've called it X Y Z because now we're using the buzzwords for the industry, right? So, I mean, I think that there's a lot of that going on. That's why I always like to just go back down to the simple basics of, of what it's. So for clean beauty, um, that definition is a moving target. Knowing that the definition is a moving target, you can define clean for yourself if you want. I don't do that. I just go by, because as a cosmetic chemist, um, I go by where the product is made. That's very important where the product is made because of the regulatory, where the product is made, and what ingredients are in that product and who's making it. That's really important too. I like to know the lab. I like to know who the scientists or the, or the chemists are uh, because that also speaks a lot about their procedure, their philosophy, how they actually put products together too. That's very important because there are ways, there's a good, you know, there's a good, better, best. There's a cheap and cheerful way of putting things together. There's a proper way of putting things together. Um, and there are things that work with an integrity that there's things that can give you a really great outcome and a really great feel, but have zero activity. And a lot of people are fine with that because it's all about that momentary pleasure. They like the way it smells. They like, they like the tactile part of it. They like its playtime, but it has absolutely no active, you know, uh, I like to know when the chemists are actually using real stuff because you just want to have that nutrient dense skincare. So knowing more about it, and you can have a very nutrient dense skincare that's very non-toxic. So technically very clean. So one of the big questions are, are clean beauty products that don't have things like sulfates, parabens, synthetics, or fragrance, are they better for you? Yes and no. Um, I think that this is, again, I don't mind parabens. I love parabens. We don't formulate with parabens, but I love parabens. I don't see a problem with parabens. It's more difficult to keep a non-toxic formula intact and shelf stable without parabens when you have to use alternative preservative systems. It's more difficult. Parabens were, are the better preservative. Parabens keep things safer. Parabens are easy to formulate. And parabens, people have made a lot of claims about parabens that are really truly not proven. Like when you go really scientifically peer reviewed, there's not much there, but the damage is done. It's got its bad reputation. People have moved on for parabens. People have come up with uh, different versions of preservative systems. Are they better than a paraben version? Don't know. Don't really know. We really don't know scientifically if they are. A lot of people will claim, yes, they're more this, they're more that. But truly at the end of the day, I think it's six of one half dozen of another. Things like sulfates. So a lot of people don't like sulfates. Um, and then what happens is, so you formulate, especially with shampoos, you're using shampoos without sulfates, and then you see a rise in things like fungus or yeast or oiliness, right? Because the alternative is so mild and it's really not getting to the root of some of the problems that people need. So sometimes a good sulfate based product is actually good for you. It actually gets down and 
fixes something. Maybe you don't want to use it every day. So maybe having that clean product that doesn't have the sulfates is a good thing for a lot of people, especially people with a lot of sensitivities. Synthetics, synthetic, not all synthetics are bad. Not all synthetic products or synthetic ingredients and not all lab created ingredients are bad ingredients. Most 100%, I would say, of peptides that are people are using are going to be lab created. Is that a synthetic? Is that a bad thing? Versus what would be the alternative? Using a human derived or an animal derived product. So maybe that synthetic is actually better. Like, you know, when, you, when you're looking at these different kinds of definitions for these ingredients and you think of what, are the, what is the alternative or what does this definition actually mean? I'm not a big believer in fragrance and product. I think fragrance does cause, like fragrance is good in the sense that fragrance will evoke memory. Fragrance can be powerful. Fragrance can uplift. There are a lot of benefits to fragrance, but unfortunately, like a retinoid, fragrance has a lot of downside, which is the sensitivity factor, is the allergy factor. And Maybe in a skincare or some product that is a therapeutic, you don't need the fragrance. Maybe go as a next step for the fragrance because you really want to get down to the problem solving part of it. So maybe that part of something being clean because it's without any kind of fragrance in it could be good. But again, it's all going to depend on you, your tolerance, your sensitivity, your ultimate goals and your beliefs and what you want in your skincare. But I really don't believe that the clean has made the product safer or better. I feel that where I stand with clean beauty, I'm quite opinionated, obviously. And I do have, I've made up my mind in the sense that I think that it hasn't really served people as well as it should. Um, but I do think that it has opened up the opportunity for more conversation and more learning, which I am grateful for, because I do think that the more education, the more we're able to start talking about things, even if we start off on the wrong foot, even if we start off with some wild, clean beauty claims, but being able to talk about it in this forum and, you know, having that ability to break it down and see what happens in practice, right? What is ha really happening out there, I think is very eye-opening and gives a really good opportunity to help create something that is much more uniform and much more to standard. Okay, so if you have any questions or comments about clean beauty, share with me your insights. What do you think? Where do you think it should go? What more do you want to know about clean beauty? How are your feelings about clean beauty? And do you really look at clean products? Does that make up your mind? Do you think, well, I'm not going to buy the latest brand because it doesn't say it's clean or not. I, I actually think I'd be surprised um, to think that a lot of people are swayed only by that factor, especially in this day and age, because I think we want more from our skincare. We want more proof. We want more science. We want more standards, but I look forward to your questions and comments. I hope you enjoyed this episode of confessions of a cosmetic chemist. I love talking to you guys. I love, um, sharing the information and digging a little bit deeper and giving a little bit of insight of what I've learned and what I've seen in this industry. And if you've got any questions and comments, I look forward to that too.